Happy Dr- Sabbath. <laughs> This is pretty cool, ain't it? I think it is. Normally, what happens in church is that um, when um, you say happy Sabbath to people, they normally respond back to you. But, um, you know, obviously you kind of took them by surprise. So, like, try it again and see what happens. Happy Sabbath. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. God is good. All the time. Thank you. (laughs) This is pretty cool to chillax. (laughs) It's good to be up here. Tell the people your name and where you're from. My name's Kenny, Kenny Curtis. I'm from Maitland. Um, I actually have two churches. So I come here on a Saturday and with my friends. And um, then on Sunday, I go to my Sunday church, which is the church that I actually uh, gave my life to Christ. And he directed me through to that church the very next day after I'd gave my life back to him. So there's... There's a big connection. You've got to be careful when you, um, when you pray for things because you don't know what you're going to get. And um, if he directs you, then you, you can't deny that, you know. You've got to go with it. You've got to do. It's not just a heart feeling. It's a whole life feeling. And especially for me, I had to really sit back and just do it. Yeah, Nike says it. So maybe they got it from God. I don't know. We're talking about um, um, being found. Um, and we was talking before, and you were sharing where you want to go with your story. And I said, uh, um, before your story, there's going to be the song Amazing Grace. And you smiled. Yeah. <laughs> you said, yeah. That, it's my song. That pretty much, yeah, that's your song. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell, tell us the journey that goes with the song. Well, well, from the time I could remember as a young whippersnapper, I was taken to church by the neighbour who was a minister at the Presbyterian Church in Maitland and just grew within the church, became old enough to attend fellowship, youth group, went on, on church camps and had an amazing time, had a connection with Jesus, with God. And then after leaving school. I was a Presbyterian going to a Catholic school. That was awkward. (laughs) Went to confession one day and the priest said to me, he goes, so tell me, how long has it been since you've been to confession? Uh, Never. And he went, what? And I told him I was Presbyterian. He said, sorry, mate, out. So go figure that. So anyhow, then I started working and then started socialising, going to rock and roll bands and, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I was one of your fans out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah and life got a, started to sort of do a bit of backsliding and, you know, there was drugs involved. I remember sitting in the back seat of my mates Valiant, rolling joints, smoking them all the way to Sydney to see these rock and roll bands. It was the 80s, hey, like, come on. Anyway, life got really young, really... So I thought I was in control of it. 24, I got married, non-Christian woman. She was a beautiful woman. She's the mother of my two children, and they're fabulous kids. But then, chasing the, the bigger thrills, I suppose, I ended up rocking and rolling with some outlaw motorcycle club members, and... That led to harder drugs, you know. You go there on a Friday night and you walk out of there Sunday afternoon and you haven't slept. So you can imagine the drugs, it was the speed. And and then that led to knowing the different people and it led to ice. I had a fairly substantial ice addiction for quite some time. Um, Marijuana was the worst one, 28 years I was using that for. That was the hardest thing to get off. I cold turkeyed off the ice and the speed to the amazement of many. And you see it all the time on the reports with the radio and TV, how people's lives go from, you know, a beautiful thing to something very ugly. And uh, the guys upstairs there on the data projectors have got a, a photo there that I'd like to have a look at. Yep, that was me at my worst. Um, 
I was about 65 kilos in weight. Lost a lot of weight, a lot, a, lot of st- a lot of weight within the community too. Born and bred in Mayland, you get to know everyone. Lord Mayor is a good friend of the family. The only people that you really become good friends with are the police. Mm. You know, I couldn't walk down the street without being strip searched. So then, that was in around 2006. Uh, 18 year marriage, gone. House that I'd worked so hard to to establish, gone. I still have a good relationship with my ex-wife and my, my kids. Uh, suicide, visited there twice. Didn't work. That was only because of God's intervention. And I believe that truly. Went to rehab in 2009. I made it... <laughs> This is the thing that you don't, you can't make a deal with God. It's God's timing, hey? Mm. It's in his timing. I was sitting for my black belt. I had to get 80 classes up for my black belt to be asked, to be invited to sit for it. And I said to God, I said, mate, once I get my black belt, I'll go through rehab and I'll get myself clean, mind, body and soul. And he had different ideas. One night at training, I got thrown the wrong way. Bang. Flat out on the floor. Busted my shoulder. Eight weeks I was out for. So there's no way I could catch up with the classes. So I sat back and I went, okay, thanks, I got that. It's time for rehab. <laughs> so I went to rehab and came out of rehab. And he touched the heart of my chief karate instructor. He credited me and all the other people that were studying for their black belts at the same amount of classes that I had missed so as I could sit for my black belt because he'd seen, he knew me. We were friends from a long way away. Anyhow, he, he just said that, you know, I'd put so much effort into getting my life back on track and this was a, a major accomplishment to be had in my life. And um, he accredited me those classes. Sat for my black belt and got through it. There was a little bit of pain and gain involved. I actually tore my bicep muscle off my shoulder halfway through it, and I had a determination. That's one thing we as Christians can't lose is our determination. We need to push through everything that comes our way. So for an hour and a half I had left to do for my my grading, I just pushed through it. But God didn't say that being a Christian was gonna be easy. He did say, though, and promises that it's going to be worth it. And um, I feel that come the day when I get my ride into heaven, I'm going to be coming in sliding sideways, you know, kick them doors open. There's another thing, too. When I prayed to God in 2009, in the January, I'd had enough of life again. I was going to bed with a with a face washer, not a hanky, because that's how much crying I was doing each night for the pain that I had in my heart. And I just said a simple prayer to God. I said, God, I can't do this no more. You need to send the love of your son, Jesus, back into my life. Let me ask you a question on that, just quickly. Um, did, Did that prayer come out of the fact that Jesus was chasing you with memories of what it was to be with him again? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm only asking because you, your prayer sounds similar to a prayer that I prayed at yes. that stage in my life. But I was conscious of that love, having found that love before. Yes. Um, did, it, did it come from a place of him bringing that back to you and then you wanting that again? Little voices, I call them. Mm-hmm. I'd be walking into town. I have no money. This is my worst. I had no money to catch a, a bus. I had racked up so many fines from terror, uh, fear evasion on a train. I was walking into town each Friday, every second Friday, because that's when you get your dole payments. I was going in to check out how much money I had in my bank account so I could go and get on. And every time I'd walk along through the back streets, I'd walk past this little church. It was just over here, just little church. And a little voice, Kenny, you need to get back there. 
I'd ignore it. I'd just put it out of my mind. But knowing the redemptive love of Jesus from my past and hearing those voices, yeah, it just, I knew what I had to do. And the morning after that was a Sunday and I woke up and I stood out of bed on the same piece of carpet I'd been standing on for two years, three years, and I felt the change. I actually felt a, a change. I felt lighter. I, I felt taller. My mother commented one day, she said, are you growing taller, are you? <laughs> and I was going, no. It's because now I can walk around with my head held high. You know, I wasn't embarrassed anymore. As much as that photo there embarrasses me, I think you're the only, this is the only other church that has actually seen that photo. I preached here recently at my Sunday church and I showed that. That was um, six years ago that I actually became clean and serene and gave my life back to Christ. So... Just to put it into a little picture, you'll find yourself at a door, and that door's got one fault. It's not really a fault, it's designed this way. That door's got one door knob, and it's on your side. It's not on the other side. So when you make up your mind, or you're driven, like I was, through the subconscious, God talking to you, be careful when you open that door that you stand back because bang, it comes open because he's on the other side. He wants to come through. He wants to be in your life. He doesn't force things upon us. He gives us the opportunity to make them happen through us. And there's just a little a word I'd like to share. I know we're on a bit of time, but one thing that happened through my life in rehab, each morning I'd sit down with my Bible and just plonk it open on the binder and let it fall open. And I'd just start reading. And it would direct me for the day coming, or it would explain the things that happened the day before. And we through a lot of the things that have been discussed here this morning with the testimonies. This just came out to me this morning over breakfast. This is my recovery Bible. It says, God is the anchor that always holds, the solid foundation that never weakens, the companion who never leaves us. Our Lord Jesus, he knows the agony of the broken heart. He knows our pain. And when we hold his hand, he understands and holds us safe and heals our hurts. His hand is always within reach. All we have to do is grasp it. Let me, let me, let me ask you to, to do us a, a blessing in here. Um, say something to people here, young and old, who are convinced that they need to be lost in order to be found. They need to have that type of, your type of story your type of 1980s. I was in the yes. 80s too. I got the same one. Yeah. But um, so, so say, say something to those who feel that, you know, maybe I need to leave Christ so that I can have a story because I don't have a story. Mm -hmm. I don't have a testimony. And maybe I need to go and get one of, these, one of these stories because they don't see the value of the story that they have. Say, say something to them. I wouldn't recommend what I did by no means at all. It was very costly. But if you feel as though God in Jesus isn't working in your life, are you allowing him to work in your life? Is there something in your life that's holding you back from allowing Jesus to work in your life? I did a children's talk in my church to explain about how when you give your life to Christ, there was an empty vessel I put ping pong balls into it. And then I poured water into it and said, this is the life-giving water when you invite Jesus into your life. 
and all the ping pong balls started floating. And I said, the ping pong balls are the things that are in our life. And when we give our life to Christ and he comes into our life, he fills up all those little voids. And I said to the kids, I said, now is it full? And they said, well, yeah. I said, is it really full? I went, yeah. So then I got sand and I poured sand in there as well. And the sand took up every, all the voids that was left. And then I said, that's the Holy Spirit that comes into our life. We accept Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes with him. And he searches through our, through our heart and he fills up all those little voids. And then just suddenly out of the blue, one ping pong ball jumped out of the vessel. And then another one. And another one. Truly, I didn't expect that to happen. <laughs> I'm thinking on my feet, how do I get this into my story? <laughs> so I've gone, that's the Holy Spirit searching your heart. And he <laughs> sees all these things that shouldn't be in there. And he rejects them. To say that now, that's what we need to be conscious of the things that is holding us back from having... The, the, to, to realise what Jesus has done in your, our lives or in, as you were saying, someone that's been a Christian for so long. We, I've had that when I came to Maitland Church of Christ and I have shared a little bit of my testimony the first time round. People coming up saying, well, man, I'm jealous of you. Come on, why is that? I don't have a defining moment in my life when I can say that Jesus actually came into my life and worked me because they'd been taken to church their parents were believers. Maybe there's things of this world that is in your heart that's holding you back from... We've all got that story. There's many things that I still look back today and it cracks me, I cry. I, I, I lead a worship team in a church and I, sometimes they look at me and they go, we can't hear you singing. I'm going trying to stop crying how can I keep singing if I'm trying not to cry because I realize I understand the pain and the anguish that was in my life was also impacting on a Jesus that what we feel he feels and every time that I, I realize now every time that I sin now even a curse word at work sometimes slips out and bang that nail gets driven again into Jesus' palm it's, yeah, we, we must be conscious of what we do. And then we have other people that turn around and say, oh, you're a Christian. You shouldn't be like that. Hypocrite. And you go, no. That's the earth. That's the, that's the, the human body. That's human nature to, to do that. So I said, I'd hate for someone as, as a Christian to say, oh, I'd like to leave the church to go and form a story of a testimony mm -hmm. the only reason why I would say you'd leave the church is go on a mission trip <laughs> yeah. go and get your story <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, know, get some, you want some pain and anguish in your life don't, don't cause it personally to yourself you know, go and find it in a sense by helping others you know, God directed me into doing mission work as well, I was saving hard I mean this is all the stories that, that I see of these not coincidences, they are got incidences in my life. I saved hard and I was going again to buy another home. But then God redirected my heart and I went to Africa and I lived there for six months. And I, I came back with basically nothing. Before I left, I looked at this house and I thought, wow, that's a lovely house, I'd love to buy that. I, I, I missed the opportunity to put a bid in on that house. Last October, I bought that house. Two years later, it came up for sale again, mm -hmm. and I saved eight grand. Mm. You know, I, I earthly, earthly, can't, earthly things you can't explain that way. Mm -hmm. But in a, a God incidence, it's like you know the blessings. It's like it's grace. Thank you, Kenny. Give him a God bless you, everyone. Thank Give him you. a God bless you. We appreciate your story. Appreciate your journey. Appreciate your journey. Our next testimony um, is coming up right now. 